Welcome. Welcome both to International House for those who are joining us live today and welcome to those who have joined us online. And thank you so much for taking the time and, the, and making the effort to come today. And we are particularly, particularly thrilled um, to say uh, uh, a thank you to um, Professor Frere, who is joining us, who has really made an effort to get to us today and to be um, our first fellow of the new year and, and a long awaited fellow. And we are, we are very delighted to be able to um, welcome you. And we hope that you might indeed be welcomed again at some point um, to, to Loughborough to, to, to work with us some more. Um, we are also very, very pleased that Emmeline Zitkus, a colleague of ours from the Design um, and Creative Arts, uh, is here today, who is uh, uh, Professor Frere's host during his time as an IAS fellow, and she is going to introduce him more formally now and the topic of the paper. As I say, um, we will be monitoring uh, the chat and the Q&A, so please do feel free if you've joined us online to ask questions in that forum, and we'll make sure that they're fed into the final conversation. We will also not keep um, any chat or discussion um, after this session, although we are recording the spoken part of this session. So you, you are free to ask questions and so forth, and um, we don't keep your data. Okay, so very much welcome, and Emily. Oh, thanks, Marsha, and, and welcome, everybody. And I'm very pleased to, to introduce you to, to Dr. Pimenta Pei uh, from Federal University of Labras. Uh, at the Department of Computer Science. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Dr. Freire and, and know more about his research in the last uh, five years, I think. Um, so Dr. Freire's research is focused on computer, human-computer interaction and information system, systems uh, with emphasis on accessibility, inclusivity, so uh, e-government, e-health, e-learning has been all focus topics that are you conducted research. Uh, and uh, Dr. Andre is also director of the Alcans Research Lab, which is a lab of usability, accessibility, and computer, computer linguistics. Um, and Dr. Freire is involved in several national, international, especially research groups that I won't be naming. <laughs> But uh, in, in scientific bodies and has published in international high impact journals and has been PI of a number of research projects as well. Uh, and I, I think this will be the topic of, uh, of his presentation today. So please, Dr. Andre, if you could please let us know more about your research and about the inclusive design of digital technology in Brazil for people with disabilities and older people. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the IAS at Loughborough University. I sound okay to hear. Was, I'm not sure if I need to go closer. Is that right? Good, You're thank perfect. you. I'm just testing levels. Okay, perfect. thank you. So, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Marsha, um, name of our uh, older team at the IAS. Um, you've been great. Uh, with all the unforeseen circumstances before I arrived here. Uh, I'm really grateful for all your support and for the opportunity uh, to come here as a visiting fellow to strengthen the collaboration um, we've had with Loughborough University over the years. Uh, so being here um, has been fantastic in that sense. So thank you to Professor Marsha and Emma Boldy, uh, IAS team, and thanks to Emmeline for the invitation um, uh, to come here and this visit and for the collaboration over the years, uh, and for everyone at the Design and Creative Arts School who have welcomed me in the last couple of days and uh, along this week as we've worked there. Uh, it's been a pleasure being here. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit today about some experiences we've had with research on inclusive design of digital technology for people with disabilities and older people in Brazil. Um, and I'll try to bring some of the uh, particular issues we've encountered, um, what it's like to do research on that kind of topic in Brazil um, as one country in the global south um, how it fares with research um, I've conducted and other colleagues I've worked with have conducted in 
other countries in Europe and in the US on the specific challenges and opportunities for research we've encountered there. Um, so I'm not going to go very long in that, but as uh, my colleagues have already introduced me, I'm an associate professor of human computer interaction, interaction design uh, with my research group on CUNCIT um, at the Federal University of Lagos. Um, um, my, my last longer experience in the UK was uh, during my PhD, which I finished in 2013 at a little bit further north at the University of York. Um, and my master's and uh, BSc degrees in computer science at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, I just wanted to show this is where Lavas is. So this is the state of Minas Gerais, um, kind of in the middle uh, between our state capital, Belo Horizonte and Sao Paulo. Um, that's our sort of um, main building and campus, and that's where I come from. So just to position kind of where we are at in our research in terms of uh, people with disabilities and older people, um, it's been a very hot topic in terms of um, digital design, technology design all over the world. Um, and there are many challenges that uh, can be excellent research opportunities. Um, and what I just brought here to give a broader context is uh, statistics. So in 2022, the estimate from the World Health Organization was that um, around 1.3 billion people or one in six people worldwide had some significant disability in terms that it would compromise some kind of function or they would need some support. Um, I would like to bring some data from Brazil, but our, our census that runs every decade is two years late, and it's just something of now. But from the census in 2010, which is the most up to date, uh, they had estimated uh, around 23.6% of people with some disability in Brazil. And in terms of aging, which is another group we've worked with, um, that's a worldwide trend. Um, it has been faster in more developed countries, but other countries in the global south have also followed the same trend of people getting older as uh, the number of younger people being born uh, has slowed down in many countries. And with medical advances and other policies, people fortunately have been able to live longer. So so from the World Health Organization, uh, there's an estimate number of around 1 billion people uh, being aged 60 years or older in 2019, with a projection of this number increasing to 1.4 billion by 2030 and 2.1 billion by 2050. So in terms of population, just to uh, have an overall um, idea of why it is relevant to research on inclusive design, we see that there is a growing trend of aging and of um, paying attention to the needs of people who have some sort of disability. Um, so it's very important that digital technology um, be designed following inclusive principles of looking at particular needs that different people might have, be it from having a specific disability, like uh, visual disabilities, which is a group we've worked a lot in our research studies, or older people who might have losses in their abilities or might have uh, cultural aspects that are different because of their generation and exposure to technology. And we have a number of issues that might impact the way that people interact with technologies. And it's very important for us, um, I mean, people in tech, the technology business and research, people who design uh, different types of technology to know those needs and to work hard on designing digital technology that can actually cater for those people. And I'm not going to spend a long time here now, but I'll try and um, 
chip in with some details in some of the studies that I'm going to present to you here. Um, but there are many particular issues that we encounter as we do research on inclusive design in countries on the global south. And there are very different challenges from those that we see um, that also occur in you know, all countries. But um, as I will show in some examples, um, and that again, for those who are um, looking at possible collaborations and on discussing different ways of looking into inclusive design research, um, at the same time as those things are uh, difficult challenges, um, I also see them as opportunities for research and for going beyond um, some things that we've seen in research in other countries and finding new types of solutions. But in many such countries, we have different levels of development of public policies. Um, so it's not particularly bad at that um, in terms of legislation. As I'm going to comment on some of the studies we've done, um, we have very good legislation for inclusivity of people with disabilities, but that's not translated into proper regulation and the operationalization of such things doesn't happen at the same pace as we would like to see. Um, and that will bring a lot of challenges in terms of technology, policy, design strategies uh, to tackle those issues. Of course, we have the economic issues. Um, I'll try to show you some examples to see that it's not always that obvious and why it is important to be in the field and to be closer to people to actually understand what goes on in terms of economic factors. There are social cultural factors, factors uh, and the diversity of people. Um, and again, as I showed on the map, um, still, I'm, I'm, I'm in, even in Brazil, I'm in the southeast of Brazil, um, not too far from like big capitals. Um, I've been to examination boards uh, for PhD students, for master's students who did research in the far north and in other places. And um, I actually felt like a foreigner um, in the sense of not understanding completely everything that went on there and saying, wow, well, that's a completely different reality. And how we do need to do research in those areas and to be aware of the needs of people who live in such places in different conditions. Um, so uh, I say that even as a Brazilian, um, I see the difficulties of doing research in certain areas and how important it is to understand the contextual factors that go on in there. Um, well, uh, as I told you before, I did my PhD in York and um, it was really nice to see how technology evolved uh, in many senses, particularly say for people with visual disabilities and how different it was in terms of the availability of resources in English in comparison to what people had in Brazil. I'll show that example um, with a project on um, screen reading software for mathematical formula in Brazil. And um, it, might, it might seem something very trivial in terms of practical aspects of technology, but the impact that this has on education on uh, people's everyday lives is huge. Um, so there's a lot to do in that sense. So um, I'm just trying to give an, an overall idea of what some aspects are that we see as particularities of doing research on inclusive design in a developing country, the global south. And um, I try to make a selection of some research projects we've conducted in the past um, and some ongoing research projects. Um, in particular, I brought some projects that we have developed uh, in partnership with Loughborough University, um, some that are ongoing, some are close to the end, and some that has just started last year, and some that are going to start now. Um, and I'll try to bring some of those discussions here of what it's like to do research and inclusive design in that context. So the first project I'd like to comment on um, it's a finished project um, on reading of mathematical formula in Brazilian Portuguese. Um, that project finished uh, in 2018. We had some follow-up um, research that we did in that, but that was a project from CNPQ, our National um, Research Council. 
Um, and we have a partnership with the Federal University of Pondonopolis um, in the Midwest. So the reason why we did that, we call it the NAP map BR, was one of the first things we noticed um, that were that's where it would have made that much sense to do the beginning of this research in an English speaking country. There were no um, software technologies at all to read a mathematical formula in Brazilian Portuguese. And even for European Portuguese, resources were very limited at the time when we started it in 2016. Some were made available uh, in late 2018, even after our project finished, we're still trying to negotiate with uh, open source software communities who have screen reader software that is more widely used by blind people. Um, but then the other side of research, which um, is still a challenge, even in uh, countries who have software available to read formula in English, we also did uh, research on how to navigate within formula, considering that people are only listening to the content and the challenges with ambiguity and uh, how to make sense of different parts of complex formula. Um, it was a very nice project. We worked with Sonia Fritsch from um, Ondonopolis, and we had an interdisciplinary team from people from, people from education, uh, from mathematical sciences, and that was one, that was uh, a first one for me, uh, to, by not having a software that could read formula in Portuguese. Um, I worked um, for many years with uh, disability support um, in Lovers. I also worked with disability support uh, back in York, um, supporting exams. Um, so one of the first things we looked for is, is there any guides to help people read formula in Portuguese? We found some in English from uh, North American institutions, found none in Brazil. So we did research with people from linguistics, um, which was also very cool. Um, one of the first results of that project, and again, uh, there was a limitation of not having uh, software that could read mathematical formula in Portuguese. But it was also a limitation that um, would happen in, say, offline, um, non-technology context in schools. How do people read formula for blind students? And that was a huge issue. And um, we did research with our colleagues from the linguistics department. Um, we interviewed uh, teachers to see how they would read formula. We analyzed patterns and um, that, that research went, that was the first time I ever published a paper on a, a journal of linguistics coming from computer science. Um, it was a lot of fun doing that, uh, but finding that out and seeing how it works. Um, then we had a first prototype based on Chromebox uh, that at the time it was the only uh, open source software that could read formula in English. And then we made the first prototype. Later on, we um, transferred that to NVDA's Access with Map, which is an open source um, add-on to this very widely used screen reader. I have the time to go on detail, into detail on that, but as NVDA is an open source software, uh, the proportion of people who use it in Brazil in comparison to say people in the UK or the United States or Canada um, is massive. I mean, uh, I mean like it's more than um, 6 to 70% of people, blind people in Brazil who use it, uh, comparing to less than 50% in the UK. Um, again, that's uh, economical factors coming into play again. We had usability tests with users. We learned a lot of how people would read it. And um, that was an interesting perspective for us. Uh, I remember talking to a colleague from Germany, from Germany when I was starting to research that. And I asked him, oh, well, well, I'm appalled to go back to Brazil and see that there is so little technological support for blind pupils at schools. So what do you do in Germany? Uh, so well, that's simple. They learned how to write formula in LaTeX and they read their formula using their screen readers. What's the point about that? Um, so I, I think we wouldn't be able to do that research in Germany with the pupils that my colleague mentioned, because they were taught uh, very early on how to use screen reading software. 
to read mathematical formula. So the people we brought in the lab to test our prototypes were blind people. Some of them were still at school age. Some of them um, left the school decades ago. They had never used any screen reading, screen reader software that could read maths. So um, there was another interesting opportunity to see what it was like for um, adults, blind adults who had never used a screen reader software to read maths. Uh, they would have to count on um, teachers or teaching assistants to help them in class. So it was a nice project. And again, trying to bring some of the specificities of doing that in Brazil with the language barriers of the, and the lack of availability of technology. And, um, but again, the opportunity of having people have a first look at what it's like to use that type of software and the barriers and the, um, the mindset that they have, the mental models that they would expect um, having never used a software like that. It was a very nice project. Um, we're still trying to work on that. Um, we are, we're in touch now with uh, some organizations in Brazil who work with the official translating translation teams who work on those add-ons. And we hope that we'll make that available to the community soon. Well, so that's an example of something that was applied on uh, education. Uh, I'll move on to a project that is ongoing uh, and it was officially uh, the first project that we did uh, where we uh, invited and I'm very grateful for Emily for accepting the invitation to take part in the project with us. Um, so that's the project that we are, this project was a continuation of some uh, previous work we did on smart home technology for people with disabilities and older people. This project involves um, of Flum, uh, Federal University of Lovers, Loughborough University, Queen's University of Belfast, and University of São Paulo. Um, it's funded, um, uh, there's a project that is going, we'll finish this year, by the State uh, Research Council in São Paulo, by federal, federal funding for infrastructure from FINEP, and investment from the university as well in Lovers. So we've seen a notable growth in uh, recent years in the use of smart home technologies. And what many research studies have pointed out is the potential for the improvement in the quality of life for people with disabilities and older people, be it by improving uh, everyday activities, uh, by helping people with everyday tasks they might have difficulty doing uh, at home um, connected to their disabilities. Um, but when we started looking into that in Brazil, um, I brought some data. It's not 100% accurate, uh, and they're not very precise in what they define by the technology penetration in households, but that's the closest we can have in a comparison. So Statista have some data on penetration of smart home technologies, and I brought the percentage they have for the UK and Brazil. Whilst in the UK, they say that in their research, more than 50% of households had some sort of uh, smart home technologies that accounted for only 9.5% um, of households in Brazil. So what we see is that very few people um, know this type of technology. Um, so again, when and we've seen that in um, qualitative research we've done, uh, very few people actually know those technologies. So there's a big challenge of designing technologies for uh, people with disabilities and uh, older people who might not or who might never heard of those technologies. So this study is going on for a couple of years. So um, I'm going to show you some examples here of what we've done. So one of the studies that was within that large framework was um, a qualitative study with people with visual disabilities in Brazil. So that was done at the beginning of uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, which was a bit of a nuisance, but uh, we had people from many different regions of the country as we had to do it all online. Um, and it was very nice to do that. And we were trying to find what factors affected the needs and the context for use of smart homes and people with visual disabilities in Brazil. 
So a study was recent, recently published on the Behavior Information Technology Journal. I, I put in the reference here um, uh, in the uh, online first version. And um, uh, it, it was a very good study for me, at least, to know more details. And uh, we went beyond only techno technological factors to understand day-to-day um, -day activities that people with visual disabilities did at home. Uh, and we arrived at uh, six themes that we analyzed. So it was very nice to understand how people go about their lives at home and around. So what activities they do, what they have difficulties with, and will be opportunities for the design of inclusive technologies that people can't do at all because they have more significant barriers. Um, and then they told us about um, what they do and uh, the workarounds that they do with things that are difficult, like that, the nasty microwave with touch only buttons and uh, washing machines. Um, and um, knowing that your microwave can do um, popcorn, but not being able to locate that button uh, using cello tape on your remote control so you can have only like. Uh, four buttons instead of a multitude of buttons. You can't be, know where they are. It was, it, was very, it was very nice to learn all of those things of what people with visual disabilities do. Then how they interact with current appliances, the attitudes of technology, and on the side of smart home technologies, as I said, most of those people have never used any smart home technologies at all. So again, we were hearing from people's perspectives um, in a very fresh manner. Um, they had only heard about those things. A few of them, it was back uh, between 2020 and 2021, they had heard of Alexa and some other things, but most of them have, had never used them. Then um, we understood more of the Brazilian context of smart homes, what people have in their houses. Um, and that's the bit where I think it's nice to stop and tell you a little bit about um, uh, doing research in the global south and the we, we had that chat many times in international um, forums that where we discussed uh, how we can include people in the global south in research and that's an example I had a very hard battle with a uh, with river number two uh, <laughs> in that paper because we were trying to report the finding that in the Brazilian context language was an issue with many many appliances and that cost was an issue. And then that's where the story began. The reviewer insisted long over the major revisions, my revisions, that cost was an issue for everyone and that I should refrain myself from making a claim that that was an issue that was particular to Brazil. And um, if I can share this experience uh, for people in the global south and for, for people who are on the other side of the table, um, both as a strategy for people who find themselves in the same position as I was, and for people who might be reviewing a paper and to think twice uh, if you find this, uh, in that situation. I had never had to do that when I was reporting on research, say, um, on e-government services uh, from the local council of York and what people did, or uh, from national UK websites and I mean there were very local things it's not to say that I've never done that but I don't remember facing issues of having people insisting on saying that well that not, that's not well explained when I did research in the UK but that it worked out well but what I had to do was to explain uh, using a very specific example that is on the paper actually uh, I never used the price um, of anything to write on a research paper. That was a first for me as well. But the example I gave was uh, the Samsung TV uh, was one of the first TV sets that included screen reader software on smart TVs. And um, what I did was not to compare just the price, but um, how much that TV costs in Brazil. And we had a very closely related paper that was done in Italy. So I compared Brazil and Italy, but to compare um, the purchasing power of people. So that TV in Brazil at the time cost more than 3,000 reals. I mean, we have currency, so, so that wouldn't mean a lot. 
but that is three months worth of minimal wage, which is the situation of many people with disabilities in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Whilst the same TV in Italy costs little less than little more than 600 euro. And the lowest minimal wage in Italy for agricultural workers is more than 800. So we have a comparison of three months wage um, worth of minimal wage, sorry, for people in Brazil and two thirds of a month's wage in Italy. So then, well, see, it's not the same issue for everyone. Uh, so that was two rounds of review uh, to put that in the paper to settle the matter, to convey the message that, well, this is what we mean by economic factors in the global south. Um, so that was very interesting. And then we asked people to envisage ways of interacting with smart homes. That was a, a nice preliminary research. Um, and then we continued with other studies to evaluate smart home technologies, we evaluated existing apps that you can download and control smart homes, both with uh, blind and people with low vision and with older people. Um, again, with people who had never used such apps before, um, we noticed a lot of lack of accessibility in general use apps. Um, we actually went on to make some prototypes of mobile apps um, that people evaluated the game. Uh, we also evaluated that with older people in Brazil to see cultural factors. Um, those are two, two of the most recent papers uh, which we report uh, those evaluations. And now what we're doing in that particular project uh, with the grant from FAPES is on the integration of smart home technologies and health monitoring for older people. Um, and it's been very nice to count on uh, the collaboration uh, from Memelen and other researchers here at Loughborough University. Um, and then that's an ongoing study where we're interviewing older people, health professionals um, about both smart homes and how to monitor health or to interact with family members, carers, uh, health professionals, and integrate, and then we uh, are close to finishing a first prototype, integrating voice assistants, mobile apps and sensors, and making improvements from previous evaluations of the mobile app that we had. Um, from the learning we had from these interviews and building this prototype, we are going to start evaluations in, of that scenario in 2023. Um, our more recent development we have there. And I mean, I think as soon as we have that ready, I think we'll have a lot of room for collaboration and future research on smart home technologies. Um, the FINEP uh, funding that I mentioned, um, that was an infrastructure funding uh, in Brazil. Uh, that project had um, funding for equipment and the university um, was going to invest in building an actual house on campus. So we hope that we'll, this will actually finish by the end of 2023. That's the preliminary project at the house, and we're going to have um, different rooms where we can experiment with different technologies for kitchen, uh, uh, laundry, bedrooms. And there's also going to be a lab uh, for fabrication, 3D printing, in partnership with our engineering department. Um, it's taking longer than expected due to uh, funding issues with universities and all sorts. Um, say the computer science department uh, has only one working um, toilet uh, for male and female, not one per floor anymore. Just to give an example of sort of cuts we had in the past years, but it looks like things are going well now. Um, there's another recent pro recent project that we've started um, on the use of Internet of Things technology in coffee production. Um, that's a project um, called PI. Um, it involves um, several departments from the Federal University of Lavos, which is uh, very strong in agricultural research, um, and from Berlinja, São Paulo. Um, uh, Emily kindly accepted to take part in the project too. Um, and in the UK, we also have uh, the collaboration from the University of Derby and Cardiff University, and US, UC Davis, Illinois, and from India. 
Um, that what they call a thematic project. Um, it's a long, a longer project, only uh, five years with a 3.5 million grant. Um, it would have a lot of technical uh, aspects, very specific uh, from agriculture, from food science, but a bit we are chipping in and we saw a very interesting opportunity to do research on inclusive design was by looking at the particularities of not just the coffee production, production but on the producers, uh, coffee producers in our region. So south of Minas Gerais state accounts for substantial part of the coffee bean production in Brazil. And actually the world um, was born and raised in that region. And I've heard, I couldn't find exact figures, but they say that in numbers, um, they have uh, the most coffee production bar per square kilometer in the world. Look, uh, we actually see a lot of coffee beans. Uh, trees as we go around uh, our region. And the statue of Pele, as we were saying, who was born um, to both places, 100 kilometers far from where I live. So coffee and football, um, they all go hand in hand there. Um, and then, um, as I said, there's a lot of very technically specific aspects to that project. But what we were seeing um, is the demographics of farmers and coffee our production in Brazil. Um, again, it's not that up to date, but the latest agricultural census in Brazil in 2017 showed that 46% of properties were led by people aged 55 years or older. That phenomenon has also taken place in other countries. Um, the aging of the farming population with younger generations not willing to continue with family businesses on farms, but again, that, that's something we've devoted a lot of attention on, uh, developing digital technology for older people. And uh, we found uh, a serious scarcity of technology to support the work, field work um, on site and farms. And on top of that, what we have is people who are aging, um, it's not the case everywhere, but in many uh, properties, there are people who were more seriously affected by the lack of schooling when they were younger. So there are people with um, considerably fewer years of, of formal education. Uh, and then when we started doing the research, we saw, well, we have a very important point here to develop technology to work on farms, in the particular case of coffee production, uh, catered for older people there. So that's something we've just started. Well, there was a first exploratory paper we did with uh, a research student now this year, but we see that along the, the other four years of project that we have, um, we hope to bring Emeline back to Lavas and the course of that project. Um, again, um, again, it's another research opportunity. And just so I don't go for too long here, uh, the last project I'd like to talk about, uh, it's starting officially, um, as I speak now, January 2023. Um, it's a project that I, I also love to work with. We've done some research with colleagues and students at the Public Administration Programme at Lavas, uh, on which I also, I also work. And we've done loads of studies looking at the legal aspects of digital accessibility. So that project was really cool to and we were really glad when it was approved involving computer science, design, and law. And we have the involvement of Ufla, um, Loughborough University, and colleagues from the Federal University of Sao Paulo. So um, the grant was approved uh, from this month on uh, by the Minister of State Research Council. So the reason why we proposed this project. Um, once again, as I said, we have those particular issues of legislation and regulation. Uh, the Brazilian law of inclusion was approved in 2015, and um, it's very comprehensive. Uh, and actually knowing the Equality Act in the UK and legislation back in the US, um, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very advanced piece of legislation, um, uh, even in terms of digital technology. Uh, whilst in, um, I'll take the example in the UK, in the UK you have the Equality Act, we also have regulations stating um, 
how government bodies and private sector entities should follow international guidelines at what level. Um, so at the same time that it's very important to have the overarching law act, you also need the nitty gritty regulation of the operationalization of that law. And that hasn't happened in Brazil since 2015. Um, hasn't been that much interest in governments, fortunately. Um, and you still see that there's low accessibility in websites, mobile apps, there's loads of studies on that. Um, and legal procedures have been seriously limited by that. Um, I mentioned one paper here that was published uh, very recently in October. Uh, we used freedom of information uh, portals in Brazil, uh, still up and running. Fortunately, we were afraid they could stop somehow. But we had access to the full description of decisions that the federal public ministry did in complaints that mostly people with disabilities or organizations made in relation to the lack of accessibility. Um, that's kind of the general federal general attorneys in Brazil. So that's kind of top level prosecution body. They are very well known for several processes they've conducted. Uh, they are highly regarded in Brazil as an efficient institution. But what we saw is that most cases were finalized with only uh, the report of an automated tool that will run through the web website, give a score, um, and that's only able to verify less than 20% of the criteria that you have to go through. So we saw that there's a lack of tools, regulation, and that the surveillance of digital accessibility in Brazil is very problematic at the moment. So what we proposed, this project was on a call to integrate research and university outreach. So we want to work with organizations that represent people with disabilities. And whilst regu official regulation from government doesn't take place, and we saw that the official bodies, the prosecution bodies, don't have uh, many people with the know-how how to evaluate websites. Um, we thought that we could try and see what happens when uh, civil society organizes themselves to file complaints with the technical support, technical backing that government aren't currently able to do now. So let's go together as universities, as um, civic organizations that's placed that, that's analyzed the impact. And in parallel to that, there were some good things that were taking place. Um, just got involved with um, an initiative from the Brazilian Network Information Center. They have some connections with government, the NICBR, and they, they have an ongoing collaboration with the British Embassy in Brazil um, that's funding this um, initiative to propose um, different ways of regulating that, that missing bit that's missing for almost 10 years. Um, so they're discussing which standards to use, how to regulate that. Um, we've taken part in the discussions and also um, a colleague from the Federal University of Sao Paulo have been approached by members from the Federal Public Ministry to help them equip um, the government or agency to perform their surveillance uh, duties. And it's been nice to talk with them. And um, um, the expectation is that we're gonna have those three things, uh, our research project, the initiative from the Network Information Center, British Embassy, and the project with the Federal Public Ministry working together to try and fill in the gaps that we have in surveillance of regulation of digital accessibility in Brazil. Um, that project um, includes two visits again, so that might be another opportunity for, for people here in Lepra to see me. Um, we'll try and organize visits. Um, uh, that, that one might happen in London, but um, the base institution in the project is Lepra University. So uh, at some point, those three years are uh, open again uh, to pay visit to London, to government or agencies, uh, and for MLN to go as well, and things go further to discuss these proposals for public policy. So some remarks, um, I've tried to highlight some research projects that we have in collaboration with 
uh, local university have led to very fruitful results. Um, we have plans for application for funding in international collaboration. Um, Len and I will have a meeting tomorrow. Other colleagues are welcome to come and chat with us as we will discuss um, some um, grant applications that we'll probably do to UK research agencies. And we have loads of possibilities for further collaboration with academics from different fields of interest in the design of inclusive technology. I come from a computer science background. Um, in my PhD, I worked with two supervisors, one from computer science, another from psychology. It's been wonderful to work with uh, MLN and design. And I've been working with people, public administration uh, in Brazil. Uh, it's very challenging. It's um, hard sometimes to learn different lingo, um, but um, it's been very fulfilling because I see that interdisciplinary research is actually where you can see your research getting to where we need to go to uh, not just technical aspects so um very open to collaboration with colleagues that are interested in these topics and here's my uh, my email if anyone wants to get in touch i'd like to thank again uh, the institute of advanced studies and the free university for the opportunity to come here in the open program as a visiting fellow I also thank uh, the funding uh, agencies in Brazil that have funded these studies, including a research fellowship, St. PQ, Papes, Papemigan, and, uh, and thanks for everyone who have come both here in person in Loughborough and people who are online. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer to any questions that you have.